I want to hear what you have to say. Anna first, quickly. It's got to be brief. So much of this poem is um, seems really specific, but in fact is kind of slippery. Um, like the way that the colors are kind of fading in and out and, and lots of colors get applied to lots of the same things and different things get described with different colors and the co and colors are just like kind of constantly sort of shifting in this poem is really remarkable. Um, and I also noticed that that, that same kind of slipperiness, like the, it's, it's exact in its inexactness. Um, the pink of five tulips at 5 p.m. on the day before March 1st. Well, we know that could either be February 28th or February 29th. Like, we don't know. Mm. Um, depends on, like, what year this poem was written. So it kind of, like, lifts this whole thing out of time <clears throat> and out of color and out of space in a way that it's just really amazing. That's fantastic. The way the whole poem just moves. Thank you, Anna. Lily, briefly, a thought? Um, I think... Usually when we use color to describe something, it's in the spirit of being exact. Um, and we think of color as like a way to exactly differentiate something like the green chair or the brown chair or whatever. And um, he's choosing colors that are surprising, like violet C. But then the more you think about it, you realize like, oh, that, that I can see that. Um, so I like that it's kind of creating an impression, not an impressionistic isn't the right word, like maybe abstract expressionist is the right word or whatever, but like a painting in front of him. Hmm. Fantastic, thank you. Amber Rose, your thought? Um, my brief thought. Um, okay, my brief thought is that I'm thinking about how th this conversation about light and color reminds me of a conversation I think we were having in week five about like, looking at a poem, uh, looking at an object and the kind of light or the aura that's cast sort of around the object by nature of putting it in a poem. Mm. Um, and I think he displays that really beautifully in the question where he asks, is it the light that makes the baby pink? Is it my seeing the baby mm. that makes, is the baby actually pink? What mm. is the relationship <laughs> between what I'm seeing and what I'm producing mm. by making this observation and communicating it to you? Mm. So just thinking about that from a couple weeks ago. That's lovely. And also there's an urban distance because the baby's presumably in another building across the way. And so there's a kind of atmosphere that you have to look through. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, there's like air particles and it's it's the end of the day. It's a very so, like rear window moment. You know? no, except not as creepy. Not as creepy. Yeah. <laughs> Jess, thought quick on this poem. Um, sure. I'll, I'll try you to be... You like it? I, I love it. Um, I'll try to be brief, which will be difficult I think but I was also thinking back to maybe the webcast that um, Amber Rose referenced um, specifically the discussion of Marianne Moore's imaginary gardens with real toads in them yeah. and the, the comment about the Ashbury instruction manual being imagined brought my mind back to that mm -hmm. comment and I think that something that I was thinking about with respect to that poem is also something that I'm thinking about with this poem and that's that like the so-called raw material of like observation or like what is seen is being played with in a really wonderful way. Um, and like oh, yeah, I saw that. the line that's, or the phrase that's very striking to me in this poem is I can't see. Um, and I think Anna, what you said about the, the, the exact inexactness um, is, is really apt. And it points to like this, um, the slipperiness of the line between like the line that we think exists but actually doesn't between like what is observed and what is imagined. Mm -hmm. Well said. Jason, quick thought. Um, well, I mean, in a way we have what appears to be the record of someone's conscious thoughts in process as they're perceiving and they're, um, those perceptions are leading to relational thoughts. Um, the, what strikes me is, um, I didn't notice this before, but the green leaves on the tulips on my desk, like grass light on flesh, is a, we have a like, it's a metaphor. The grass light is not necessarily on the flesh at the moment. And 
as the same as like a woman who just came to her window. It flows so simply that we assume that there is a wo woman at her window, but there it's not necessarily so. Right, exactly. And um, yeah, and I'm uh, the the four lines at the end, the the it the it is um, contraction. I am just interested in. Yeah, it's a powerful it. Um, this is an it that while Stevens perfected, which sort of means everything that we've been dealing with in this poem and all the issues that I bring to the poem from all my previous poems and everything that I've ever thought of, this whole thing, it's sort of the thing he can't get over, how it all works together. That's the it. Uh, mm -hmm. That's great, Jason. Thank you, Erica. Your thought on this? I'm I'm thinking about something that Davy brought up, which is how this poem works in contrast to the other poems that we look at this week, particularly the the refrain of "I can't" and how different that is from the O'Hara "I do this, I do that." And I'm also thinking about how this poem looks or is working in comparison to Barbara Guest. I think of Barbara Guest and Skylar as both be doing as both doing something different than Ashbury O'Hara and Coke. And I think that this poem and the poem in Modpo Plus by Barbara Guest is perhaps better than twenty, are both examples of really intense looking as being central to New York school. Um, and the subjectivity of looking as being something that happens through the action of a poem. Mm. And I think you see this a lot, like February is a really beautiful example of that. Fantastic. Uh, the reference to the Barbara Guest poem in Mod Pope Plus is a reference to a poem called Roses. Mm -hmm. And it is uh, explicitly thinking about Stein and Picasso and modernism. It's really worth, given the rose sub-theme of Mod Pope, it's worth looking at. Thank you so much, Erica. Amaris and then Gabe on February. Amaris? Hi, Amaris. Show that it's his perception. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, now we can. Okay. Amaris, I, I think like your connection is slow. Bringing all these disparate elements. Do you have yeah. Wi-Fi there? I do. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, you should contact your uh, provider. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, g give it a try. You're going in and out. See what we can do here. Okay. Um, so I like it that it's his perception that's bringing all, all these elements of see into harmony. And this poem really feels like watching the process of a painting being created. Um, it's not just uh, the colors that are lush, but this sentiment of gratitude that seems to bring the poem into coherence, and uh, particularly that repetition of the it's in the last four lines. At the, the, the same time, the poem is particular to this specific day, and yet it seems like, like it's an experience of um, gratitude and attention to detail that he's replicating every day, and he says it's a day like any other, but he's bringing that um, that sensitivity to his everyday, regular basis. I love the idea that the attitude, the tone of gratitude helps synthesize, brings things together. Mm -hmm. It's really so Schuyler-esque and really New York schoolish. Okay, Gabe, your thought on February, and then we're going to move on. Uh, the number is 610-616-3208. Gabe, hi. Hi. Um, so as Davey was saying, because it's not a peripatetic poem, and, but, it, because, but it's a poem of looking through the window, it's a poem that takes the windows quite seriously rather than just presenting it as like the, you know, a, a sort of thing in the way. It really thinks about that frame of the window quite seriously. And I agree with Amaris that it's sort of like the frame of the window becomes like a painting frame so that what's being seen outside is thought about in a more sort of like honestly artificial way. And I think like what's so interesting, just going back to Jason's uh, comment is like 
the work that the it does in that whole equation of framing of, of visualization, you know, you have that it all, but you also have like Tracy Morris is it all, but you also have the way that the it's at the end are moving from like the tip of the tulip to the shape of the tulip, to the bottom, of, to the water in the tulip, to just the entire day. There's something really going on there with frames. Mm. Mm. You know, Gabe, that last thing you said, it makes me think that, um, one of the things that poets of you know all times and all cultures have done is exactly what you described you know poetry the idea of poetry is you start with an observation or a particular and then you physically look outward from there to see if you can make some tentative generalizations about the world i think philosophy kind of works in the opposite way of course there are exceptions to both of these statements but you know philosophy is really good at saying something like proposition 1.001 the world is all that is the case i mean that's a that's a brilliant statement but what the hell you know um